Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Be Well Clinic channel. I'm Amy Mahali, and we are going to talk about sleep today. Going to chat just for a few minutes, give some people time to join us so they don't miss anything as we get started. Speaking of chat, there is a live chat that is here um, on your screen, probably below, or if you're on your phone, it will be running. Uh, here is the live chat. Here's where you can ask questions. I will see them and can answer them as I'm talking. It's the way you can communicate with me um, as we are teaching this class about sleep. So welcome. Welcome to anyone who this is their first live. Um, excited to have you here. Also welcome if it's not your first live. <laughs> um, it's been really fun to teach these and to be on with you guys. I am coming from my office. So you see my messy bookcase here, but um, in my office today and uh, recording from here. Okay. Let's see what else I need to tell you. Um, we uh, do these classes every Tuesday. We are switching to 7 p.m. since the days are getting longer and summer is here. And it's hard to stop your day at 6.30 when it's not dark outside. <laughs> so uh, we are doing six, 7 o'clock um, for the month of June at least. And we're just evaluating as things change. We also are going to do more quick topics, um, a little more narrow of a focus um, this month on different topics. So these won't be as long. That's pretty exciting. Okay. Well, welcome to everyone. Um, Again, if you want to be in the live chat, you can find it. Um, it's near the share and save and, you know, all those buttons. There's something that will say chat if you don't see it already up. Uh, you can jump in at any time with questions and that comes through. You don't have to have a YouTube account to log in. It's just a Google account. So um, you can log in with a Google account and type in a comment. Um, you don't have to have a YouTube channel or anything like that. Okay. Let's see where I want to position this here. And we will get started. So today we are talking about sleep. Sleep is such a huge issue. It's a really big issue right now. It has been for months, but truly it is a big issue in our world, um, in our modern paced fast world. It is something that is so elusive for many, many people. There are a lot of reasons why. And the good news is a lot of those reasons you can, you can um, help, you can change, you can um, alter, you have control over, you can make different choices, or you can take action and change things about your sleeping situation or pre-sleeping situation or daytime situation or health situation or nutritional status, all the different things that are um, part of sleep. So we're going to talk about a lot of those today. I think that's all the things I need to say to get started. I'm adjusting where I want the screen to be. Okay, maybe I'll be a little closer. That's a little better. Okay. Um, a few things that I want to talk about um, would be sleep for the ages. So let's just talk about sleep in general. Why do we sleep? Sleep is very good. It's very important. We need to get sleep. Um, there's a lot of jokes on in different movies and things like that about, you know, caffeine patches that keep us awake and with no side effects, which is not true and things like that. But we can get wrapped up in the idea that we don't really need sleep or we don't need to sleep at the sleeping times, meaning it's not a big deal if you go to bed really late and get up late because if you get your seven hours of sleep in or six hours of sleep in, then you are fine. Um, but is that true? So let's talk about that a little bit. One of the biggest things um, with sleep is also hours of needed sleep. So there is no hard and fast rule in this. There are ranges of sleep. Um, scientists have studied this a lot. Research have studied this a lot. And there are people with very, very strong opinions about how much or how little sleep that you need. Um, I want to throw some general numbers out through all of the ages. So in babies... Um, because many people who are with us and are following our channel um, are moms or dads. And the main reason they're not sleeping may actually be their baby um, or their child is waking up multiple times a night. This happens all the time. Parent, if this is you, you are not alone. I have this conversation usually at least once a week of helping parents help their child to learn how to sleep so that they can sleep. So I want to talk about what a normal sleep expectation is through the ages. Um, we're going to talk about 
a lot about adult sleeping or people sleeping, but I am going to talk specifically some things about babies because often a child or baby not sleeping is the reason that the adult is not sleeping. So that's definitely going to be one of the categories here. Okay. Um, I will post these um, sleep expectations by age in the comments after I'm done. Um, so you don't have to write them all down necessarily. Maybe listen to them and, um, you know, listen for the one that you or the few that you are in your life, if you have kids or if you're an adult. But let's talk about that here. Infants, um, 15 to 17 hours of sleep a day in a 24-hour period. So that is something an infant defined in this list as a baby under three months old. So they are sleeping a lot, but it's broken up. Um, and it doesn't matter as much. They probably will sleep a little bit more longer stretches at night, maybe. Um, mom's hormones are actually quite active at night, so babies often cluster feed if they are needing to stimulate milk production for themselves and their nutrition. So infants, 15 to 17 or more hours of sleep in a 24-hour period. By three months old, infants should be able to sleep for six hours uninterrupted. So that's quite a bit, and three months is fairly early. So we're not talking a 12-hour stretch of sleep here, moms and dads, but you should be able to sleep for at least six hours uninterrupted. A four to 12-month-old, they are going to get 12 to 16 hours um, in a 24-hour period, and that's including naps. Um, and they should be getting, again, at least that six-hour stretch, so from midnight to six or 11 to five or something like that. They're getting that stretch of sleep, and then that should be extending. It is possible and fine for an infant at four months old to be sleeping seven, eight hours of sleep in a stretch um, and even potentially more. By a year old, um, they should easily be able to sleep through the night. If they are not sleeping through the night, they probably have a, they're not getting enough calories, not getting enough nutrition of some kind, or their body is toxic or there's something else going on. So um, if your child is a year or close to a year or over a year, they should be able to sleep all the way through the night. If not, there's probably a health, underlying health or nutritional issue that we need to address. Um, this includes adults too, right? A year on, we should be able to sleep through the night without any problem. Um, one to two years, they're going to get 11 to 14 hours of sleep in a 24-hour period, including naps. Three to five years is 10 to 13 hours per night or naps. Um, 9 to 12 years old, it's 9 to 12 hours. Sorry, 6 to 12 years old is 9 to 12 hours of sleep per night. A 13 to 18 year old is going to get 18, 8 to 10, sorry, 8 to 10 hours of sleep. 13 to 18. So that teenage year, 8 to 10 hours of sleep. I need quite a bit there. And then adults, we're going to settle somewhere between. Some people really are okay with 6, 6 and a half, although you have a little hard time convincing me that that's a healthy person. But occasionally I have seen that and I do believe the person's healthy. But that's kind of the edge of the bell curve. Most people are going to be more a um, seven to nine um, to ten hour of sleep a night is a good amount. So eight to ten hours of sleep, in my opinion, is really probably what we need. Um, mostly we won't need those 10 hours unless we're you know, healing or we have some long-term health issue that we are recovering from. A healthy body, though, I do find needs seven to nine hours is pretty average um, as I look on my own data. Um, the, the place I got all these was just for children, so I didn't have that um, adult data I've looked at before, and it's widely different, but six to 10 hours would be the range of sleep that people say that you need. Um, and most people don't go to 10. Six to nine is most common to say. Studies have proved that consecutive hours of sleep are associated with improved attention, behavior, um, improved behavior, improved learning, improved memory, improved emotional regulation, and mental and physical health. Of course, we all know that, right? But it's very, very nice to say it. Um, out loud. We know that we need to sleep to be healthy. We know we need to sleep to be okay. So um, when you're not getting sleep, a lot of different health issues can come crashing down um, and become big issues when they weren't before. We talked a lot, we talked a bit about sleep last week, if you were there for the hormone talk, um, and I would, the endocrine system, um, I would recommend going and listening to that if sleep 
kind of the hormonal side of sleep that we talk about is an issue um, for you because I'm not going to go into that much detail here. Um, but if we have a dysregulation of cortisol or melatonin or um, norepinephrine or, you know, any of the numerous hormones, if we don't have the right balance, sleep is going to be affected. If we don't have good sleep, our hormones are going to be affected. So we really do need to have good hormone balance and good sleep, and they will hinder or help one, one and the other. Okay. So consecutive hours of sleep are important. Um, the other thing that is important about sleep is the timing of your sleep is also important. And there's a lot of different specifics, and I'll throw some of them out there, about why we need to sleep when it's dark outside. Um, when we look historically, uh, we, we have now created an artificial environment where there are artificial lights and we can make it be whatever time of day we want it to be. Um, now there are jobs and I used to work them nights, um, nights in the hospital that you, there are jobs you have to be awake at night. And that's an, a, a tremendous sacrifice people are making. Um, doing it for years, it, it is a big deal. I never felt um, as rested or well, um, as, as I did when I switched back to days, because you just can't get the same quality of sleep when you're sleeping at night. It's just not how it works. One of the things that we've done is we've created this artificial world and environment is we have, um, we, we feel that we don't have to follow the same rules that the rest of nature follows. The rest of nature does rest at night or there are nocturnal animals, but they're designed that way. Um, we are designed to not be a nocturnal animal um, and we are designed to sleep at night after the sun goes down and to wake in the day when the sun comes up. There also is going to be a huge variance, by the way, of how many hours of sleep you will need as a healthy person, depending on what's going on in your life and depending on the seasons. <clears throat> in the winter, we tend to sleep longer because... The, the nights are longer and it's a time to re rest and recuperate. Our bodies are more stressed with trying to keep warm. Um, there are more illnesses that are potentially an exposure to us. So we do need to get more sleep usually. And then in the summer, it's very common to feel that you are good on six, six and a half, seven hours of sleep. Um, if you are a well resting well and, and having a healthy, well-nourished body. So don't feel like you also have to always say, oh, I'm a nine hour person, because maybe in the winter you are in the summer, you're seven or something like that. So um, be flexible in your own observation of how your body um, acts and and feels good on. But also know that there are some there's some rules we can't we can bend but not break or all of nature bends. You know, some bears sleep all winter. Right. So there's just so many things that change seasonally that change with the circadian rhythm of the day and we are part of the circadian rhythm of nature right we we are in that just like we are part of the lunar cycles um what 60 plus percent of our body is water of course we're affected by the moon right so there's just lots of things that are changing um depending on what's going on outside in our outside world which some of us don't have very big access to so that can be really difficult Okay, so circadian rhythm in my notes. We already talked about that. Um, the other thing that's cool about sleeping at night and sleeping before midnight is that our immune system and our, our repair systems work more, work better before midnight if we're sleeping than they do after midnight. I believe it's four times more effective. It might be as high as 10 it's been a while since I've heard um, that statistic, but it is more, multiple times more effective, your immune system and your repair of yourself. Inflammation calming, repair of torn muscles if you work out too hard one day, um, any kind of soreness, any kind of illness, any detoxification, all of those things happen more efficiently in the hours that you sleep before midnight than the hours that you sleep after midnight. The other really helpful thing to our bodies is if we can sleep and go to sleep in the nine to 11 o'clock hour, um, this is on the Chinese body clock, um, the spleen time, uh, it's triple warmer technically. Um, spleen is actually the, the uh, opposite time. It's in the morning, 12 hours opposite. So that spleen time, nine to 11 a.m., 
is at its weakest at 9 to 11 p.m. So if you can go to sleep during that spleen time, it does seem to help and affect and nourish your spleen to be ready for the day. Why is our spleen important? Eh, it only coordinates our digestive system, helps our immune system function properly. It's kind of the mother, right? It gives of itself until it has nothing left to give. Um, so we want to nourish it and care for it and keep it well. So if you are having headaches in the morning, like 9 to 11 o'clock in the morning, and then they wear off, you may have a spleen deficiency. It may be a little bit undernourished or overworked. So it's really important for you to get to bed at least before 11. And often much closer to you know 9 or 10 can be helpful. Okay. So lots of reasons to go to bed. Um, especially when we're sick, right? We know that we go to bed early, we sleep a lot because a lot of repair and a lot of immune activity happens while we're sleeping. Um, we can be in a different metabolic state when we're sleeping. Okay. Other things that can affect the circadian rhythm, our adrenal gland and our cortisol production can get messed up. And this is what I talked about a lot last week. Suffice it to say that we can start getting a adrenal cortisol spike later in the afternoon and the evening, which keeps you up and wired until two in the morning. And then that spike curve naturally curves down and it comes to its low and it doesn't peak again until maybe 11 or noon the next morning. So these are people who are up late at night and then sleep in really late and are just dragging in the morning. Um, this is a cycle that we need to get out of and we can help ourselves get out of it. Some of it is just going to bed. Um, but not always. It doesn't always work. Um, there's lots of other essential oils and other hormone things we can do. Again, I talked a lot about that last week, so I don't want to talk any more about that. If that is maybe you, go listen to the talk from last week. Okay. Uh, oh, we talked about immune system already. So for your spleen's sake, for your hormone's sake, for your adrenal's sake, um, for your thyroid's sake, and for your circadian rhythm, um, and your immune system that are, these are the reasons why we need to sleep. And most of us like to sleep. Most of us, um, if we have trouble sleeping, uh, we may justify why it's okay or what we're doing, but truly we would also like to just go to bed at 10 or 11 o'clock at night and sleep through the night beautifully, wake up without an alarm between six and seven in the morning, right? Doesn't that sound lovely? That may not seem like anywhere close to a reality for you, but pretend it is a possibility. Doesn't that seem so nice? Um, I'm a night owl. I love my brain turns on at nine o'clock at night. This is something I've really had to work on and really adjust things and evaluate myself um, and what is good for my health and my body. Because being awake at nine and not finishing a project until 12 or one, while incredibly productive, was affecting negatively other parts of my health. And what I found was when I switched the cycle and it took a, a painful switching period, I was able to enjoy other times of productivity in the morning um, or even in the afternoon or occasionally at night when I really needed it and I could sleep, but not as a rule, not as a habit. So um, anyway, just that throwing that out there. Okay. When we look at why we don't sleep, because as you hopefully know, I believe I operate very strongly on the belief system that everything that we do is the best that you can do where you're at and everything we do is for a logical reason. I do not think that you are staying up late because you want to stay up late or you have no respect for your body or anything like that. Of course not. Um, I know that you are a responsible, kind person who wants to be responsible and kind with your body. Of course you do. So when there's something that you can't do, a habit or a, a pattern that you know is good for you or you want to try out and you can't um, or you just it doesn't work, I believe there's a reason. So I want to talk through some of the reasons that you can affect and play with and see which ones are important for you. Um, some of these are nutritional deficiencies. So we're going to talk through a, a fairly good list about that um, or extra foods that maybe aren't helpful for you, especially around bedtime for sleeping. There are other things like electronics and white, uh, blue lights and um, things in that type of category. Some of these things are more important to some people and less important to others, right? It depends on what's with your body, what's your strengths and weaknesses of your body, and what does your body need help to support. So let's talk about food first because why not? <laughs> it's why we're here, right? 
Okay, the things, we need a lot of things to sleep. Our bodies are incredibly complex and we will never ever understand them. But some of the main big rocks of what we need to sleep, we have a um, B vitamin need, a calcium need, magnesium helps us to relax, minerals in general, um, specifically the calming minerals um, are helpful. Iodine is important, uh, especially for a thyroid. We need a functioning thyroid to be able to sleep deeply and to stay asleep without stress. We also need a body that is not toxic. Um, now, what's interesting is a lot of the list I just read overlaps into the toxicity list. So what do we use to process toxins? We need to feed our liver. We need to support our liver, which sidebar, if you are a vivid dreamer or a nightmare dreamer, your liver, it's one of the, the signals your liver sends to you to say it needs some help. It's overwhelmed. So if you are vividly dreaming consistently or having nightmares or bad dreams consistently, um, or even daymares, right, up in horrific imaginings of death of loved one type of stuff, that's a liver symptom. So we do want to support the liver in that. So how do we support the liver? B vitamins, vitamin A, that's a new one. Minerals are helpful. Um, beet kvass is helpful for the liver. So there's lots of things that we need to do. A lot of people have liver issues and that's why they're not sleeping. So liver ties in very strongly with the nutritional needs because often it's because the liver is not getting fed that it can't do its job or it's stressed out. Okay, so what can we do to correct these? Um, eat the foods. <laughs> so... Um, B vitamins, calcium, calcium and magnesium are good. I don't recommend in most cases, there are some cases, but not for this case. I don't recommend taking calcium citrate or glyconate. What you want is calcium lactate if possible. Um, there are companies that sell it. Standard process is the one I use. They can process also has a correct balance of calcium and magnesium in their calcium lactate powder. And I find that for most people that is very, very helpful. Oftentimes we are more magnesium deficient than calcium, but we often hear about that. So many people are already supplementing magnesium and still having leg cramps or restless leg um, or trouble sleeping or teeth grinding. And in that case, you may need more magnesium, but you may also need calcium because calcium and magnesium are interactive with each other. Calcium helps with detoxific detoxification. It also helps with our body to rest. So if your muscle, um, my muscle can rest right now. Well, not right now because I'm holding it right, but it can rest um, because it's just waiting. It's ready and waiting. It's primed with calcium is one of the reasons why there's a calcium potassium pump that happens when you move your muscles. So if there's not enough calcium available, your muscle is going to be very spastic. When there is enough calcium available, it can just relax and ready, be ready for the signal to say, go, fire, move, right? Um, so when we have twitchy legs that can't sit still or muscle cramps, um, we're often looking at a calcium deficiency um, and sometimes a magnesium deficiency. Minerals in general help us to detoxify and they also help our nervous system to be calm. This is important. Our nervous system cannot believe that a tiger is going to eat us when we're sleeping because then you're not going to sleep well, right? That's, that is a, it makes perfect sense. Um, it's an obvious, bold, st obvious statement to say, but when you are in fight or flight, you won't sleep well. So it is very important to get your body resting and out of fight or flight. Some of this is feeding the body so it feels safe and, and like it's going to make it through the night. There's going to be no blood sugar drops or anything like that. We need to feed the thyroid so it feels safe. Um, and we need to have enough nutrition and enough calmness that our body and our nervous system can feel like I'm ready for anything, but nothing's going to happen. I don't have to be on alert. So cholesterol and minerals are the two main things that our nervous system needs and B vitamins. So if you take nothing else from this talk, eat more B vitamins, minerals, and um, cholesterol, fat, saturated fat, saturated animal fat. Those are the three things that we want to eat. Calcium is also important, but not, not always. Uh, it's not the top three, but it's the close fourth. So, okay. What else do I have on this list? Iodine. Iodine is very helpful because it allows the thyroid to function well. And the thyroid is pretty active at night. 
Um, trying to see if it's on my chart. It is not specifically um, on my Chinese clock there, but the thyroid is very active at night. And if you have problems waking up or just restlessly waking up multiple times, um, even if you can go back to sleep, then you probably are having a little bit of thyroid stress and your thyroid saying, I, I need some help here. I can't quite do my job well to keep you asleep. If you wake up through the night like that, it's thyroid. If you wake up at three o'clock or one to three o'clock, um, it is that's the liver time. And that's often showing, again, another signal of your liver saying, I need help. So supporting your liver is a huge way to help yourself sleep. By the way, lung time is from 3 to 5 a.m. So for people who have asthma or other lung issues and you're having trouble sleeping in that 3 to 5 a.m. window, you may be detoxing heavy metals through our lungs because that's where we detox heavy metals and your lungs may be crying out for a little help. Good news, you need cholesterol and minerals and then vitamins A and C for your lungs. Okay, great. Okay, that's all I want to say about that. So going back to nutrition, I bring it back to babies because we know this. Try having a baby wake up that's hungry and telling it it's not morning yet. Go back to sleep. I know you're hungry, but you can just sleep until morning, right? That's absolutely ridiculous. We know that will never work. The baby needs food and then it will sleep, right? That is the same thing for us. Our bodies can't rest well if they don't have enough nutrition to help them to rest and relax and be okay through the night. We're going to wake up. We're going to wake up multiple times if we don't get up and eat. Um, so when you are looking at sleep, especially if you suspect that your cortisol levels are imbalanced, um, you may want to consider eating a meal a little bit later in the evening, trying to time it. It's better to not eat two hours before bed, but maybe don't go four hours before bed. Right? Try to time it so that you're eating something close to closer to bedtime. There are lots of times in my healing journey that I have eaten five minutes before I went and laid down, but I didn't eat a meal, right? I ate some sour cream with honey, or I ate a, a mug of meat stock, or I ate a couple egg yolks and whipped up with honey, a Russian custard, um, or I ate some yogurt, right? So do something that's not crazy hard to digest, but I found that if I went to bed hungry, I woke up clenching my jaw, my whole body was tight, I just did not sleep or rest well. And I just needed to feed my body another meal closer to bedtime so it had some nutrition to go through. And then as I healed, just like as babies grow up, we can then manage to not eat for all overnight. And that's not a problem. Um, so um, look, listen to your body. And it's not a problem for me unless I'm really stressed. And then I often do have to give my body that little extra fat usually to get through the night. Another huge thing to do if you're not sleeping well or your child's not sleeping well is just double your fat intake. Whatever you were doing before, two tablespoons, four tablespoons, half a cup, double it. Usually if you double your fat intake, you will find a very significant improvement in your sleep within a couple days. I found that to be true about 90, 95% of the time. So just eat more fat. Okay. Other things that will affect our sleep would be your blood sugar going crazy at night. This is going to be affected, of course, by carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, especially if eaten alone instead of with a protein or a fat. Processed sugar chemicals. There are neuroirritant chemicals in a lot of processed foods, and that's going to push your nerves into fight or flight. Um, we also just sugar in general, right? Um, and toxins in general are also irritating. If you have a little, you know, pinprick of a toxin constantly irritating or a hundred of them constantly irritating your nerves or your muscle or your cells, that's irritating. You're not going to be able to rest and sleep. Um, it's going to cause a cortisol increase because your body's like something's attacking. We have to do something. So, when we get toxins out of our body, we're going to be able to rest. And that's a whole nother category that we can move to now. Um, so to sum up nutrition, we are feeding specific organs as well as feeding the body. The thyroid, very hungry organ. Immune system, very hungry organ. Spleen needs a lot of help. Warm foods support loving, nurturing. Spleen is like nurture, nurture. It's when you, what you think of. It nurtures you. You nurture it. It's all the warm soups and you know custards and like that's what the spleen loves okay 
Um, thyroid needs a lot of protein and fat is helpful, mostly fatty acids to help with the um, calcium and uh, it needs vitamin F, which is a fatty acid, linoleic acid. So thyroid is, is needing quite a bit of food. It's very hungry. The immune system to be able to repair damage needs a lot of food. Um, and then your adrenals also need pretty much what the lung needs, minerals, cholesterol, vitamins A and vitamin C. Okay. B vitamins are hugely important. Nutrition in general, we just have to eat enough food. You have to eat enough meals. It can be really hard um, to, to eat enough meals. One, we're busy. Two, the world tells us don't eat food or you'll get fat, which is a lie, by the way. Um, not if you eat the right foods. If you eat bread all day, yes, that's a problem. But if you are eating nutrient-dense foods, fats, meats, eggs, good vegetables, fermented vegetables, um, you know, well-prepared foods with some grains, potentially, um, for most people, some grains um, and carbohydrates are good, but not as a majority. This is going to help your body be very fed, very ready to rest, and very ready to work and be alert in the morning. All right, toxins, we can also help get the toxins out. This is why I take a detox bath most nights. Not only does it help take my body out of the emotional state of stress, go, respond, to a relaxed state of we are safe and ready to sleep, but it also helps remove toxins from my body. So it's a very nice um, transition time for me in the evenings. Um, let's see. Other things that can help grounding, can help detoxify and balance our body. One of the things that again happens in our modern world is we get a lot of negative ions built up in our body and in our system. Negative ions come from natural things like wind. This is why you may feel kind of awful when it's windy um, or when a storm is blowing in and the barometric pressure is changing. There is a lot more negative ions in the world than, than our bodies are balanced in. Um, the earth itself is a balance, right? So this is why grounding or earthing helps. This is walking bare feet on the ground. And um, there's different on, on natural fibers or natural things. So you can't stand on asphalt. It doesn't count as ground. You can stand on concrete. That does count as ground, but it's not as conductive as wet grass or wet sand would be, for example, right? So do the best patch of ground or close to ground. Dirt is great too, um, dry dirt's not going to be as good as wet dirt. Wet dirt is messy, I understand, right? So what conducts well? Minerals conduct well. Wet conducts well, right? That, those are all conductors of electricity. So try to find the best environment that you can find that is a, a vibrational frequency, meaning like dense concrete, right, is a much lower vibrational frequency, and those molecules are vibrating you know, just a little bit and very close together. Whereas something like water um, has a conduction, but it is more active moving. Um, plants, grass has a lot of water in it, right? Minerals are also good conductors. So if you happen to live somewhere that has more minerals in your soil, as opposed to clay, like we have here in Colorado, um, you're probably going to have a better conduction. I don't actually know anything about the conductivity of clay. So... When you are earthing or grounding and you're touching the ground, the negative ions that are built up in your body, which cause tension and stress and this right, increase in, in the fight or flight um, sympathetic activity, that they're going to be balanced to the earth because that's what happens when charges touch something else. It balances the charge, right? That's why we get shocked when we touch someone, when we've been shuffling our feet against the, the carpet, right? So when objects come into contact, they balance their charges. That's all you're doing with earthing. We have gotten a negative charge from electronics, um, in the air, in your house, touching them, your electricity in your house, the wind, um, certain chemicals and foods will be more negatively charged. So often we have become more negatively charged through our day. So it's good to go ground for a few minutes I ground until I yawn. Um, I often feel a bit of a tingle from that charge release, especially if I've been feeling really tense. Um, and it takes somewhere between two and five or six minutes for me um, to feel that charge, um, charge reversal and to just feel my body settle into a more relaxed state. So it's a very nice thing to do.
after your hot bath so you're nice and warm, go out barefoot for a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, let's talk about our electronic exposure as well. Any questions so far? Feel free to jump in any time with them. I'm getting close to the end. Again, we're doing a shorter topic with shorter videos so that hopefully it's more shareable and more rewatchable than some of the longer classes we've done, which have been awesome, but you know, we're gonna try some short ones too. Okay, um, so other things that affect sleep would be electronics. Now this is gonna be the electricity um, that you're next to, like your computer on your lap, maybe not a great idea, as well as EMS in the air from your Wi-Fi. Now you may not have too much of an issue with this um, while you're awake, and there's a specific reason why you would want to turn them off at night. Um, but just be aware of what you're doing in electronics. The other is actual literal screen time. So there's been different research done. Screen time is not necessarily created equal. And so I'm not saying don't do screens at all, um, but let's talk about some better ways um, to have screens be less affecting of your circadian rhythm and sleep. So number one, there is something called blue light, right? It's on the spectrum. So there's red lights all the way to blue lights. Think a rainbow. The blue lights are only in um, sunshine, right? So we have the full spectrum of light during the day with sun. So if you are after sundown, exposing yourself to full spectrum light, either from lights or from your screens, you are, your brain is getting the signals of it's still time to be awake. So it is very normal for people to not get sleepy, right, until the sun goes down, historically. The sun goes down and then you start getting sleepy. That's why we sleep longer in the winter and yada yada. When we are exposed to blue light for four or five more hours in the day, your cortisol may re-swing up because it's been so long. Um, you're still awake and so it recycles and pulls up to another spike and then this keeps you up all night. So it's important in that case to, to know your body. There's been for years and years and years, it's still true. I often get sleepy between 8, 8, 8.30, 9, 9.30 o'clock at night depending on the time of season, right? When it's been about an hour after sunset. If I don't go to sleep pretty quickly after that, I will be awake until midnight or one, sometimes two o'clock in the morning. That is different now. I, I do, I'm gonna tell you some tricks about putting a different light so that you are awake, but not in the full spectrum of light that can be helpful. But I, I knew that about myself. So think about for you, do you know what time you get sleepy in the evening? And depending on how your family was, a night owl or a early bird, you may find that going to bed at eight o'clock at night is socially acceptable. And you may find that it's not. In my family, 10 o'clock is the, 10, the kind of the early going to bed. So it's a big major mental shift for me to say, oh, 8.30 is a bedtime instead of 8.30 is when you start doing stuff, you know. So um, you may need to uh, think through and, and look at that, but try to lay your biases aside and just think, when does my body get tired? When is it ready to sleep? And then evaluate what you can do um, about going to sleep then or sustaining that sleepy time um, so that you don't reawaken and then are up for a, a four hour cortisol cycle before you can rest again. Okay. Before that cortisol gets broken down. Because if the cortisol is not broken down, your melatonin won't work. Melatonin is what helps us to sleep. So if you have too much cortisol, you won't have, you won't feel the action of melatonin um, because it, or it won't, it won't be able to make you sleepy. Right. Okay. How do we keep electronics from keeping us awake? Number one, have a blue light filter. They have these on your computer. They have them on the phone. Um, you can have the blue light filter on all day. And there are definitely people that find like high stress, high anxious, like your body just does that. It kind of ramps up all the time or very easily. You may try to get a blue light filter on your electronics all the time and or wear blue light blocking glasses, those yellow glasses. Um, get those and wear those all the time. 
Um, they have quite fancy ones that look very nice. They don't all look like weird, you know, Coke bottle glasses anymore. They have quite nice, um, very uh, unobtrusive glasses now. So go ahead and try that um, if this is you. You can just wear those at night after the sun goes down, switch into moonlight mode, which is reflective of the red spectrum of light a lot more, right? Candlelight, firelight, like until now, um, and I'm sitting under a full spectrum light right now. Um, until now, we didn't have the blue light after sundown. It just didn't exist. So our body was able to drop its circadian rhythm into a better place um, much easier um, and much quicker and more, more correctly, more nature cycle, circadian rhythm cycling. Okay. So blue light glasses, maybe all the time, blue light blocking glasses. Maybe all the time, maybe just at night, maybe just after sundown or just an hour or two before you're ready to go to sleep. That could be really, really a life changer for some people. And for some people, it's not its not a big deal. Their body is not living in that much cortisol. It doesn't need that much sing signaling to be able to go to sleep. One other more simple way um, to help reset our circadian rhythm is to watch the sunset and if possible, the sunrise. This really gives our body the visual clues of, hey, it's the sunset. So we are starting to pop into this other mode of operating um, that is nighttime mode. Okay. All right. Um, so screen time in general. Now, what are we watching on the screens? This was a fascinating study that I read a while ago, and I'm sorry, I don't have the link at all. I don't even know if I could find it. So you could go look and see. But they did a study to see what type of I think the original like title of it was if you watch movies with friends, you have a different chemical hormonal neurotransmitter balance than if you watch movies alone. So really cool about that. But when you start playing into the implications of that, um, I don't remember if it's that article or another article I read that also was talking about watching black and white movies or movies with real people versus the very psychedelic, bright, artificially bright colors that are in so many uh, animated movies, kids shows, all of those things. They are not helpful to the brain to rest. They actually are stimulating the brain and often overstimulating the brain, causing a, a stress response, dopamine hits. They do create addictions. Um, the brain responds in the same way as it would to a drug um, in many of these screen things. That's why when you try to take your screen away from your child, they often cry. And when they get off, they are maybe more fussy. And those days that you forget or you're so busy, you kind of have a different kid. Um, and that's true for adults. I, I know I noticed this looking back, knowing it, right? But looking back, I knew this. There was a difference when I watched a movie with my family in bed or in the living room than when I sat on my computer and watched the same length of time um, by myself. Um, there was a difference between watching movies and not watching movies. There was a difference when I had days that I would take off and not watch any TV versus because I just it was good for me to not um, versus days I did watch even one half hour show and my irritation level and things like that. If you're irritated when you watch a movie or when it's done, you have your ner nervous system is was overstimulated in that time and underfed. I'm not saying never watch TV or never be on a screen, um, but just be aware of how much your body at this moment can handle. Can it handle that whole screen or not? So um, that's one of the things you want to look at. OK, so screen time. So what you watch is important. A lot of time I watch Dick Van Dyke's show because it's a black and white, real life, slow paced, but not too slow. Andy Griffith was a, is a little slow for me because my brain's a quick brain, right? I'm not a, I'm not a slow talker, right? Um, I have a quick brain, but I needed something to be quick enough, um, but still slow and unstimulating. So in, uh, Dick Van Dyke's show is the perfect match for me for that. Um, and so I watched that, those seasons through quite a bit when they were on Amazon Prime. I don't know if they are now or not. It's also great to read a book or do something that's not a screen. <laughs> if you are doing things like gaming, think about what time of day you game. Probably gaming would be earlier. Um, better to do earlier or the first thing in your evening instead of the last thing. Um, you know, again, I'm not against Netflix and chill or... <laughs> the real Netflix or anything like that, but just be aware of how your body's interacting. Do a, 
uh, screen detox if you can, even for a whole weekend or even a whole day. And just notice what your mood, what your hormone balance is like, and then proceed from there of how important it is for you to avoid screens, to limit them, to limit them to certain types, to get blue light blocking glasses, right? So I'm just giving you lots of ideas and options to figure out what is helpful for you, okay? All right, electronics, um, meaning are you in proximity with them? This is more the grounding and, and electrical things. Now, I did say that having your electronics away from you while you're sleeping specifically is helpful. Here's why. When you sleep, your cells open to detoxify. It's how they, it's when they clean up. It's one of the reasons why we get so restored and rested when we're sleeping. If your cells are open though, they are more vulnerable. That's why they're closed during the day because they are more controlling of what is entering in and the environment. But if you're sleeping, you should, and historically you were in a safe place without chemicals, without electronics, all those things are pretty modern. So when you have your Wi-Fi on at night, it is more damaging to your cells because it is not, it's not resting. Um, it's not in a place of, sorry, your cells are open because they're resting and so they're more vulnerable. That's what I meant to say. Went off on a weird train of thought for a moment. So it's great to turn your wife off at night when you're sleeping. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, if that's a hard thing to remember, get a timer, like a burglar alarm light timer, you know, or your Christmas light timer or whatever. Um, plug that in and um, put it on a, a cycle so that you at least from midnight to six or something, at least that main part of sleeping, hopefully 10 to six um, is when you're sleeping from. Um, that main part of sleeping is you're not getting assaulted by at least your Wi-Fi. Now, people will say, I live with other Wi-Fi's. You know, they, they show up on my computer, so of course they're coming. Or apartment, apartment's hard because you are just going to be close to electronics. Um, it's, I'll get to that in a second. Um, what I would say is every little thing that you do for your body is a helpful and good thing. So if you have electronics and a Wi-Fi signal that you turn off from your Wi-Fi router, it's going to assault your body with EMFs less than if you still left it on, even though you have four other neighbors that are far away, okay? Your Wi-Fi is closest to you. So the other thing is electronics in general. Um, you can get meters. If you live here locally, the Fort Collins Library rents out a meter. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but if you look at it, it's a EMF reader meter, EMF meter reader. Um, you just point it at your outlet or your light and um, or your Wi-Fi box and it shows the it registers on a spectrum how much electronic interference, I guess, is happening. And this is going to be it was very fascinating. So you can find two things. You can find EMF hotspots, um, which you could clearly see where our router was and there was a tunnel over the whole thing. Um, you can also find things like uh, dirty electricity. So sometimes the wires in our plugs and outlets, which should be totally fine, those shouldn't give you any trouble, but sometimes they get crossed and so it's creating a resistance issue and that actually increases the electronic feedback. Um, so you may actually get that sometimes. Um, so you could find those and you may find one of those is right behind your head and you're getting with, hit with you know, a couple hundred megahertz of electrical interference in your spectrum of where you're sleeping, well, that's going to stress the body out. It's not like electrocution, but it's kind of, you know, it, it is still giving the body the stress signal of the electrical um, frequencies and, and uh, interference. We are electrical beings. This is why EMS affect us. We are electrical beings. Okay. Um, sorry, I keep saying K at the end of my sentence. It's just time processing today. The other thing that would be good is to look at your sleeping, oh, look at your sleeping environment and see what electronics you can get away from you. If you are sleeping on a mattress with a metal springs in it, you are sleeping on a conductor, a battery pretty much. So be careful about where things are plugged in. If you have a plug in each side or running underneath your bed, um, you may be kind of creating a bit of an electrical 
bed that you are sleeping on, and that's going to cause issues for, um, for you as well. Some people aren't going to notice it necessarily that much. You may be sleeping fine, but remember, everything you can do to help your body rest and recover is going to beneficial. Why not skyrocket what you're doing as opposed to just, I'm okay, I'm managing, because you're sleeping anyway. So plug your stuff in somewhere else. Um, you know, check for dirty electricity behind your head, that kind of thing. Cell phones are electrical little hot spots, right? Um, they're also getting EMF signals in. So in the least, keep your phone at least four feet away from you. At the best, turn your phone off or put it in an entirely different room while you're sleeping. This also helps you not be on your phone and scrolling through your phone at night, because even if you have the light filter on, remember we're looking at artificial covers, emotional content if you're on social media, as well as um, just the, the stimulation of, of the screens, which in itself does something to our brain, okay? So we have all of that as we are going. Um, so phone in the other room or at least across the room as far away as you can, preferably in airplane mode, um, would also be helpful, right? Um, or completely off. If completely off phone is not gonna give you any radiation, then you could keep it next to you if you want to. What do we wear on our wrist? We wear Apple watches, iPhone watches, whatever the other ones are called. And there are some specific body tracking watches for sleep and other um, heart rate and things like that that are actually much better than the Apple watch. Just FYI, I can't think of the name off the top of my head. But if you do some research about EMF safe um, health tracking watches um, or mood, I think it feels like it's something with mood anyone knows, please put it in the comments. Um, anyway, that's a very cool thing that I have friends that do that that are very passionate about EMF. So I know they've researched it. I know it's fine. Um, but if you're wearing a, a little receiver, giver and receiver of EMFs on your wrist while you're sleeping, you as an electrical being are getting signals all night that are going to disrupt the electrical activity in your body because that's how electronics work. Okay, this is not a voodoo science. This is not a weird thing. It's just how electronics work. You can't put two electronics next to each other um, and expect them to work all the time. They potentially will interfere with each other. Um, it's a huge part. I've had engineering friends tell me it's a huge part about um, designing a box like a computer is that you have to stop all the different electrical parts from interfering with each other and canceling out or messing up the action of the other part. The ones that can function perfectly fine, completely separate, but when you put them together, it's a problem. So we wanna make sure that we are not hindering our own body's desire to do things by putting electronics um, or EMFs near our body as much as possible. Okay, electronic screen time. Cortisol, we talked about hormone balance, feeding your body, and toxins. So in summation, what are the things that you can look at and explore um, to get you started? First off, we have feed, food. You have to feed your body. You need B vitamins, cholesterol, minerals, specifically calcium, magnesium, iodine are the first ones to start with, um, but lots of minerals are needed. Um, I like the Baja Gold Sea Salt, B-A-J-A -A Gold Sea Salt. You can get off Amazon or from their website. That is very high in potassium and magnesium and sulfur, which help us to detoxify. Um, A vitamins are helpful because of the liver, eating liver, supporting your liver, um, eating warm foods, eating enough cholesterol, getting enough iodine. All these things support our bodies and support the organs that support our bodies. Leaving out processed foods, chemicals, dyes, sugars, processed carbs, not eating those late at night, not eating them alone because a blood sugar spike messes your hormone system. It has to be balanced and that's going to create a lot of work for your body and potentially put you in an imbalanced state. At the same time, glucose and insulin are both inflammatory. They are both going to cause inflammation and cause cortisol. So if they're both high, even if you make enough insulin to take care of that cake, five pieces of cake you just ate, um, you're going to have a lot of inflammation from these both of these molecules until everything's stored away. And you don't want that to be happening when you're trying to sleep. You probably won't sleep very well. Um, toxins in general are going to be harmful to you. Um, they're going to stress the system out, cause an increase of cortisol, um, as well as just irritation and harm to the cells. 
Um, if you wake up at three, it's liver time. If you wake up at, sorry, one to three is liver time, three to five is lung time. Um, you wanna go to bed before 11 for your spleen and as many hours before midnight as possible for your immune system. You want to not overstimulate your nervous system and your fight and flight adrenal response with cortisol by not watching screens, preferably a few hours before bed, um, reading books instead, not at least in the least, not being exposed to a lot of blue light and a lot of stimulating, uh, hyper colored, hyper stimulating things um, at night. Those are great things to watch earlier in the day. Um, a good old fashioned movie, black and white, doesn't have to be black and white, but natural colored, natural filmed, um, you know, a talking show, a sitcom, a, a uh, rom-com maybe, you know, things that are people interacting and talking, you're just watching a show as opposed to a Marvel movie or something like that. It's gonna be much more intense, right? Okay. Sleep is important. If you're not sleeping well, there's probably a reason why. So it is okay to admit that you can't sleep well and to find different ways. Don't give up. Don't be frustrated. I'm here to help. If you would like some help to um, figure out what specifically your body is needing or doing, um, or if you try to do some of these things like eat liver and you just can't, um, or you can't eat more fat because your gallbladder is sludgy and you get nauseous every time. Um, or if you have spleen issues, uh, my spleen at one point was very, very weak. And when you have spleen issues, you can't move minerals very well. So you can't tolerate minerals. And it, that's a whole thing. But there are ways to support the spleen um, so that you can then tolerate the minerals that you're deficient in because things compound and get worse and build on each other. So detox baths at night, grounding, turning your Wi-Fi off, um, what's on your screens, what is your light. The other thing I do, so... There you go. Let me tell you my sleep habits, especially when I need them. So I am a pretty active person and my body is pretty healthy and, and compensatory now. It can compensate pretty well. Um, before I had to be a lot more careful with a few things, but there are still some healthy sleep habits that I do that I find work for me. So when I am home and ready to start winding down, it's, it's done with project mode, it's time to wind down. I make sure that my automatic timer on my phone um, puts the blue blocking on, um, as does my computer, I believe. It looks quite blue right now, but I think they both turn off. Um, or if I'm, if I'm stressed, I, I won't be on them, right? Um, reading a book. I turn lights off. I try to turn some of the big bright lights off. I, will, I have a 40-watt bulb in my bedside lamp, and I'll turn that on and turn other things off. I am a bright light person. It drives me crazy to not have light. But when I am um, sitting with the, the 40 watt bulb, um, when it's time to wind down, I don't mind that because I'm shifting my mindset. I'm not in, I need to be aware and alert and see everything. I'm in a, we're in a safe and cozy and warm environment, right? So I'm training and teaching my nervous system that it's time to switch to the other mode. I'm aware about what I'm eating. Am I hungry? Um, I just, I know for me, I can't go to bed hungry because I will not sleep well. Um, sometimes I take B vitamins right before bed. This doesn't always work. Sometimes they're excitatory and energizing, but most of the time for me, they do help. Um, I'll sometimes take calcium before bed if I really need it, especially if I'm sore or had been working outside a lot. Um, if I eat sugar, like a little honey or fruit, I make sure I eat fat with it. Uh, it's not usually my food of choice. Fat is usually my food of choice before bed, but I might have a little date dipped in tons of butter or something like that. Um, I am paying attention to where my emotional state is and what I am doing on Twitter or um, Facebook or Instagram and what I'm looking at and what I'm getting involved in. Um, right now there's a lot to look at, so I'm being a little bad about that. Um, Thankfully, I'm just too tired and I go to sleep anyway, but just be aware of that. Um, put your phone down or check that later in the day, in the middle of the day is good. Um, the things that you look at for the 30 minutes before, right after you wake up, you are just coming out and you're in some theta wave activity. So you're very impressionable. So if you see a whole bunch of posts about how the world doesn't seem safe or how, you know, 
people are mean or whatever, it's going to impression on you for the day that that you're going to operate in that emotional state much more likely. So it's better in that first 30 minutes to not be on your phone or to listen to something. I have to listen to the Bible in the morning um, or listen to music, um, listen to calming music or just be quiet, just not have my phone on and not really um, do much on it. Um, is in, definitely not social media is a much better thing to do. So that was a fun fact I just learned. Those first 30 minutes, you're very impressionable about, and it's going to set kind of the mood for the day. All right. Well, we talked for an hour. Sleep is a very important topic, though. So I'm, I don't regret anything that we, any any minutes that we spent together, I don't regret it. But that is what I have today. Um, I'll kind of close up, but if you have any questions, go ahead and shoot those in really quick. Um, also, if you're watching this later and on the replay, because there will be a replay of this, so feel free to share this. Please do share this with your friends who need to sleep. Um, you can chat your, you can type comments in just like you would in any YouTube video. Um, and that shows up and I can, I'll get notified of those and answer those. Um, thank you for being here. Um, just so you know, we do our education um, for free. Um, it's part of what I do. I love to teach. Um, however, I, you know, things cost money and that's, that's fine. Um, but if you want to support our educational endeavors, then you can donate to me continuing to be able to teach um, by going to bewellclinic.net slash events, which will list all of our upcoming events on our website. And it will also have a donate button um, where you can select an amount, $2, $5, $15, whatever you want um, to pay. Um, I used to charge like a $10 for an hour, hour and a half class um, just to give you a ballpark, but I, I don't care. I trust that I will be, people are so generous in um, giving as after watching classes. Um, and some people give a lot and some people don't do any and it works out and it's great. I'm not worried about it. I love putting this information out, but just so you know, that's there if you want to contribute. Um, bewellclinic.net is our website. I do personal consults along with Holly, who is um, in our practice as well. Um, we are both, I think she's graduated. We're both or will be soon um, GAPS practitioners, um, as well as have been helping people for years with nutritional advice, um, helping the body rest and be ready to um, interact with this world. Because the good news is, even though we have a crazy world that we live in, the good news is we can do a lot. We have so, so much at our disposal for helping our body cleanse and feed and be prepared and be not stressed, to have good stress tolerance and all of that. So it's a lovely place, a lovely opportunity that we have. Love to help you if um, I can be helpful and appreciate you sharing this with your friends. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. I see no questions. So um, go and have a great night's sleep. Talk to you later.